Good evening. I'm Avery Lowe for the Holland Museum. Thanks for joining us virtually this evening for Monica Smith's program, Playful Invention, Inventive Play. We are proud to offer these types of programs to our community at no cost, but if you'd like to make a donation to the Holland Museum, please go to our website, hollandmuseum.org slash support. We really appreciate your support. Just a few housekeeping things before we begin. Uh, using Zoom, I just want to remind everyone um, that if you have questions for Monica, please use the chat box located at the bottom of the screen. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we can go through and get some of those answered for you guys. Um, I'd like to thank Nissa Buning, Emma Grant, and Monica Smith um, at the Smithsonian for all their help um, preparing for this program. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Monica Smith. Monica is the head of exhibitions and interpretation um, for the Smithsonian Museum's Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation. Monica will be discussing how children's play parallels inventors' processes, uh, tying into Spark Lab's goal of fostering invention and innovation for our young visitors. Um, we hope to potentially be able to open the Holland Museum Spark Lab soon. And I will let Monica get started and let her introduce herself some more. Thank you so much, Avery. I really appreciate it. And thanks to the Holland Museum for giving me this opportunity. Um, again, my name is Monica Smith. I'm head of exhibitions and interpretation at the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And yes, that is a mouthful. Um, <clears throat> you should see my business card. Anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight to talk about a project that um, I worked on admittedly quite a while ago, so forgive me if I forget some key uh, element uh, or, or don't explain something clearly. Feel free to hold your questions till the end and then I'm happy to answer your questions as best I can and have a discussion with all of you. Uh, so I just wanna start by saying um, that this project um, really helped to inspire the Lemelson Center's Spark Lab, which is a hands-on invention gallery uh, that opened originally at the Museum of American History, um, actually back in 2008, um, in a first sort of um, prototype version. We learned a lot from that that then became our official Draper Spark Lab, which is um, still at the National Museum of American History. I will mention that in fact, the National Museum of American History is reopening to the public after a break for this uh, terrible COVID virus, uh, is reopening on tomorrow, Friday, um, ticketed only. So if you were in the DC area and would like to visit us, it has more limited hours and days than it did, but it is available uh, to visit with tickets. However, our Spark Lab is currently not open because it is a very hands-on space, um, unfortunately, but you can at least come and enjoy our museum. In the interim, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the Lummelson Center is and then talk about uh, how we developed this Invention at Play exhibition, the research we did, inventors we met, some of the things we learned, and then I will sort of bring it on to how we then use that to establish the Spark Lab. So I will make an effort not to actually read the slides to you. I hope that you can see them clearly, um, but I did want to reinforce that the Lemelson Center at the National Museum of American History is a center that is really there to educate, engage, and empower the public, as we say here, um, and to inspire people to see themselves as inventive and to encourage young people especially uh, to encourage them to uh, take in, uh, their inventive skills and abilities and hopefully put them to use in the real world, help pro solve problems, um, and potentially become inventors themselves. And we are very fortunate to be at the Smithsonian where we have amazing collections and archival materials um, from inventors and innovators, scientists, engineers, and people across many disciplines who are inventive. And we have the opportunity to help uh, support that effort in collecting those. We do a lot of interviews with inventors. Um, and then we use a lot of this material that we are researching to bring that information to the public through exhibitions, public programs, hands-on workshops, and places like Spark Lab. So this is just a picture of a few of the inventors we've met over the years. If you're familiar with Spark Lab at Holland Museum or at the Smithsonian or at another uh, unit of the Spark Lab National Network, we're very proud to have other partner museums across the country. Um, you may have seen this. This may look familiar. Um, we really believe these three educational um, points are important 
and we reinforce them with everything we do. So as I said before, we believe everyone is inventive. Um, we want to support and encourage and enhance people's inventive skills and abilities, which we believe are innate. We also believe that invention should be seen as a process, much like science is often talked about as a process. Um, all too often in popular culture, it is talked about as though there's some eureka moment and inventions just come full out of uh, someone's head and uh, that's it. But in fact, it's a very interesting, compelling and somewhat complicated process. And we have tried to sort of outline it with using these um, it phrases as we call them. But this is not a linear process. These, these things think it, explore it, sketch it, create it, try it, tweak it, sell it. Um, there's often a lot of back and forth between these steps as inventors, um, usually working with many people, um, try to go from thing to market. Um, and also we want to point out that although invention is often taught uh, in the US as some sort of 19th century, maybe early 20th century phenomena, that in fact invention innovation have always been a vital part of the American experience um, and continue to be today. And you may not have heard of the inventors behind some of your favorite products, the things you use every day, but in fact, we are all surrounded by inventors doing really interesting stuff that impacts um, not just our lives, but lives around the world. So just to give you a sense, this is our uh, public space at the National Museum of American History. As you can see there, Draper Spark Lab uh, had an eager line on this day. And we also have an exhibition gallery, uh, which currently has an exhibition called Places of Invention, um, and then a small gallery called Inventive Minds. This kind of sums up more of our invention education approach. Um, I was speaking to some of these things, but I think it's really important to note that this is really about skills-based, problem-solving, open-ended, experiential invention. And as much as possible, we want to broaden the definition of who inventors are and what inventors do. So we try to feature as much as we can the work of diverse inventors, both historical and contemporary, you may never have heard of, but you've probably been impacted in some way by the products that they've developed or the processes that they've developed. Um, so shown here are a couple of photos at the top um, and on the right of the young girl there uh, are from our Spark Lab space when it was open. Um, and then on the left, that's me with a very short haircut uh, <laughs> during a, a hands-on program that we had years ago. But we do tend to focus on families with children ages six to 12. But that said, I'd like to point out that we really believe that invention is for everyone. And we try to encourage, no matter their age, uh, children and adults to participate. So we also do a lot of uh, historical scholarship and research, as I mentioned. And I think one of the things that makes the Lummelson Center unique is how we bring together research and education so that they feed each other and inform each other. Um, in this particular slide, you'll see at the top um, that's my colleague, Carlene Stevens. She's a curator at the museum in the gray sweater there. She is showing off literally Thomas Edison's initial tinfoil phonograph. Um, and so she is talking to visitors there. So we do have the opportunity to actually show real objects um, from some of the famous inventors, but also those less well known. Um, for example, on the bottom right there, that's our archivist, Alison Oswald, showing an inventor, Manny Villafania, who was visiting us um, some materials from the uh, collections in the Archive Center that actually talk about the, among other things, uh, the inventors of some of the packaging of places like McDonald's. So we really go from, you know, very basic sort of all American day to day, everyday objects to some more famous um, pioneering um, artifacts. So Many people ask us, well, why focus on play? What does play have to do with invention? And I think it's really important to point out that we have had the unique opportunity to interview literally hundreds, if not thousands at this point of inventors um, of all ages and backgrounds in different fields about their work. And one thing that was very interesting um, that came up very quickly in the early years of the Lemelson Center when we started working on this project was how much inventors would talk about the importance of play and how what they did as children, um, their experiences, getting to mess around with things, take things apart, put things back together, um, experiment with the worlds, 
um, sort of basic physics um, was really important to them and that often they had a mentor of some sort or a parent or teacher or cousin or someone who really um, supported their inventive play. And this play work connection we thought was a great way to help bridge the gap between the visitor, the public, people who often don't see themselves as inventors and inventors and show how, in fact, we are all inventive because we all play. And through play, you can learn um, a lot of different skills and abilities as a child, uh, both hands-on and minds-on, um, that can actually lead to a more inventive uh, approach as an adult in your work and daily life. So here are some of the analogous types of play that we were talking about. And I think it's important here to stress that when I talk about play, I'm not talking about sort of the narrow definition of sports and games. I'm looking at this as a broader child development definition of play. And these are four inventive types of play that we sort of pulled out as particularly um, analogous to what inventors do. And we didn't just sort of pull this out of our hats. Um, we did do a lot of research, um, primary and secondary research uh, with inventors, but also with play psychologists, child development experts, educators, and historians to look at what were some of these um, sort of analogous types of play that we could feature and would help make invention more accessible and interesting and fun, frankly, for the public. So these are the types of play that um, we're talking about. And um, I think it's important to note that, you know, humans have a very, compared to a lot of species, have a very long childhood. And apparently species that grow up slowly grow up playing. It's an opportunity for um, us uh, to learn about the world and get to know um, it's what we can and can't do, what things do and do not work. But also um, if we get a chance to really explore in an open-ended fashion, um, sometimes we discover things that someone else might not have thought of or are more open to new ideas and new experiences. So um, even though the exhibition is closed, I thought it would be helpful, uh, rather than talking in the abstract, to show you what this exhibition looked like. Um, it was designed as a traveling exhibition. So this was when it very first opened at the National Museum of American History back in 2002. Uh, yes, that was 18 years ago. <laughs> and then it traveled, um, well, actually, this original 3,500 square foot version and a smaller version um, traveled around the country to a total of 22 locations around uh, the US and one in Canada. And so we had the opportunity to reach millions of people um, and at, at a wide variety of history, science, children's museums. Um, and the I, project goal, as it says here, was really to get people to experience for themselves this relationship among play and invention and creativity that is so important and that inventors themselves talk about as being key to their experiences. So here are a few fun images from the exhibition. Um, as it says here, the main message that we had for the exhibition, which clearly helped inspire Spark Lab's uh, educational approach, is that we are all playful and inventive. And here are some uh, pictures from actually the sort of reop reopening when it came back to our museum of some different groups enjoying it, including uh, this great picture of adults on the right there in their uh, beanies, <laughs> experiencing this an activity called Rocky Blocks. Um, we had another one here in the middle with a YMCA camp where they could uh, make a ramp using kitchen utensils um, and try to, have the ball roll down in different ways, fast, slow, um, try different designs. And then on the left, um, we had in, featured one of the inventors as uh, Newman Darby, who invented the sailboard, which is the precursor to the windsurfer. And in the exhibition, you actually got a chance to try it on land on a simulator based on a design that he himself had built um, to teach people how to do this. because It was the first time that people had been able to sail by themselves with one sail uh, standing up on a board. <clears throat> so uh, again, I don't want to belabor the exhibit too much, but I think it's important to talk about sort of the approach that we took and sort of the main points. So 
We, of course, wanted to feature historic and contemporary inventors. As I mentioned, we try to feature many who are diverse and maybe not the inventors you think of. Um, to group their stories, we decided to use inventive themes, uh, things that inventors themselves had discussed as important ways of uh, approaching invention. Uh, one such as shown here in the upper right, borrow from nature. A lot of inventors are inspired by nature. And that wall that you see there had little uh, red knobs. And if you open them, you've got stories of inventors who were inspired by the different animals and plants that are shown on that picture. Um, we also have this area down below called Recognize the Unusual. And we have other themes, which I'll talk about more in a bit. Um, in addition to these, we had this invention playhouse with um, activities like you saw in the previous slide. And we had Shape Your Thinking Through Play, which offered a chance for us to actually show, among other things, some videos from the inventors and historians and psychologists and child development experts that we had interviewed, um, along with some quotes from inventors about what they played with as kids and how it influenced their work. So these are the main inventors featured in the exhibition. Um, we had one sort of highlighted inventor or group of inventors in each of the thematic theme areas uh, that I mentioned, thematic theme areas, uh, you, you understand. Uh, so uh, one up here in the upper left is Stephanie Qualak, who invented Kevlar um, at DuPont. Um, she was in the, uh, or recognized the unusual. Um, she represented that because she uh, was doing some testing on essentially uh, early polymers and uh, had this polymer that acted kind of funny, not what she expected. And um, so she convinced some people in her lab that they should test it. She thought it had some unusual properties. And it turned out to be incredibly strong, but lightweight. And Kevlar became a key material for all sorts of things in our lives from bicycles to uh, things uh, like a bullet resistant vests um, to your canoe to uh, sports equipment to um, lots, lots, lots of products um, that we, we just take for, for granted. And yet this woman was really pushing the barriers of being a woman in chemistry um, when she came up with this invention in the 60s. Um, down below her is Newman Darby, who I mentioned as the inventor of the sailboard. This is a great photo of him that his wife took uh, as he was testing out his first version. As you can see here, uh, it was a flat, it looked almost like a door. It's a, a scowl. Um, and he was testing it on a lake. So at the time, he saw it as more of a, a lake, uh, calmer water, a kind of um, sports equipment, not so much what we think of now um, with windsurfing on the ocean. Um, but uh, there's some great video of him testing this out. And as I said, we also had his uh, a version of his simulator in the exhibition so you could try it out yourself and see how hard it was. Um, in the middle there, you see this large group of people. One of the reasons we included a team like this is we really wanted people to understand that a lot of invention happens in teams. Um, we have a tendency in the US to focus on independent individual inventors. Um, but in fact, um, most inventors, even Stephanie Qualak, for example, uh, we, you know, worked in labs with a lot of other people. Um, in this case, the IDEO product design team has designed a lot of are kind of everyday objects, um, but you don't know about the people, you just know about the objects. Um, and so they also teach their inventive design process to other companies, uh, which was great because it meant we could really talk to them in depth um, about their process, about what they've learned about invention, um, and then have the great opportunity to actually uh, follow a project they were working on for they were designing a stroller at the time. And what was great for us as historians, um, as well as people doing an exhibit, was that they allowed us to um, keep some of the prototypes that they built along the way um, and to be able to have literally from their initial research where they watched people, how they used strollers and all that, to the final product. And um, so it was an interesting way to look at sort of where a lot of invention happens and to get a chance to document it as it was happening. Um, down below to them uh, in the middle there is James McClurkin. Uh, he's one of our favorites. Uh, he was just a great um, inventor to work with. At the time, um, he was a 
graduate student at MIT. Uh, he now works at Google as an engineer. And he developed these little robotic ants. And it's very, very interesting. He was using a background um, not only in engineering of robotics, but also biology to study how swarming insects worked and how they communicate, and then using that for um, these robots that he called ants. Um, and so uh, he has since moved on to some other projects, but um, he was a great opportunity to watch a younger inventor at work at the time um, and to focus on you know, the fact that invention, as I said, is happening all around us, often at universities that we're not aware of. And then certainly last but not least on the far right there is Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. Um, we often see him as this old gentleman, white haired, uh, but in fact, he was fairly young when he <laughs> invented the telephone. Um, and he was not the only one. There were other people working on phones uh, or similar uh, multi-telegraphs is really what they were initially working on. Um, but it's a chance for us to feature a famous inventor whom probably most of you have heard of, um, but from a different angle. And in this case, we were looking at how he was a teacher of the deaf. Um, in fact, his mother and his wife were both deaf. And he um, was really interested in how the ear worked and, and how sound worked. And it was because of that approach, rather than being an engineer per se, um, that he came up with his concept for the telephone. And so he was the center of our Borrow from Nature section. And again, we had a key message for all of this, which is that inventing is a creative activity that involves play. And hopefully through the stories we told, we would talk about their childhoods, their inspirations, um, how they came up with their ideas, who they worked with, um, some of the challenges they faced, but certainly the playful approaches they took and tried to make them as, as uh, relatable as possible. Um, I just wanted to give a few other examples of some inventors. Um, this is not all of them in the exhibition, and it's certainly not all of the inventors we have featured over the years. But um, we had uh, a really interesting array of people. And so I just decided to, to pull a few here um, to show you, uh, to make the point that, again, there's a lot of inventors out there you've probably never heard of, but have done important things, um, or even less important things, uh, but things that do affect our lives. and. Um, so here we have, um, at the top there is Ruth Foster, who invented this gentle lead dog collar. You can certainly see how Borrow from Nature, uh, she did studies, as is shown in the sketches there, of how dogs move, um, how they work, how uh, their, their, the shape of their throats and so on, um, to come up with a dog collar that was less painful for them to wear. Um, we also have uh, Paul McCready, who you might have heard of. Uh, he is a human-powered flight pioneer who has, in fact, uh, his gossamer, I think it's his gossamer condor is in, in display at the um, Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum. Um, but of course, he was inspired by birds and trying to come up with how you could do human-powered flight, which of course has been something of interest to people uh, since Da Vinci. Uh, so um, that was an interesting story to be able to tell about him, we actually got to meet him shortly before he passed away. Um, and then the Velcro inventor, George Demestral. Um, I mean, talk about a sort of everyday product that we all sort of take for granted. Um, well, he was out for a walk with his dog. Um, the dog got burrs in his fur and uh, also in George, George's socks. And so they started to look into, uh, he started to look into what was, what did it look like, which you can see there a, a close up um, and realized that that could make a really good fastener. So, um, you know, you can always learn something from your pet. Um, we also had a chance to talk with um, some inventors who had other challenges that they faced. And um, these range from this uh, Shaka Gil who invented this UV waterworks um, water purifier um, that was used um, primarily for developing in third world countries um, because water purification is such a difficult um, task, and um, he's from um, Berkeley. Um, we also had this young inventor, she was a teenager, um, Krista Moreland, who um, had uh, cerebral palsy, needed to have some uh, therapy, and came up with her own design for a therapy water bike, uh, shown here. Uh, and then we had the Snuggly Baby Carrier. Uh, for those of you with children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews who you carried around, um, 
She was inspired by seeing African women with uh, their children tied closely to their chests, which is actually really important for child development to hear their mother's beating heart. And so she designed, based on that, a version um, here in America that was, uh, you know, she did a lot of testing, working with medical groups and parental groups and all that to come up with a design um, that was both great for the baby and the parent. Um, so there you can see her with her husband putting it on for her. And uh, certainly you've probably heard of these three, um, at least the inventions, not the people. Again, I should point out, I got to meet all of these people. So these, these stories are not just about me reading, you know, someone's life story and saying, oh, that's cool. These are people we actually got to meet and talk to and interview and then feature in the exhibition talking about the role of play and invention. Um, so uh, Art Fry, for example, the, the inventor of the post-it note, along with Spence Silver, who was the chemist who came up with the adhesive, uh, he was great. And of course, you can tell he was playful. This is actually a picture he gave me personally. Um, and uh, he talked about the willingness to play around in the lab um, and try different things. And when an adhesive didn't work quite right, instead of throwing it out, they thought, maybe there's something else we can do with this and came up with the famous post-it note, um, which kind of funny, I think, as a side note, um, when they came up with it, 3M apparently wasn't too sure what to do with it, wasn't sure it'd be successful. So Art and Spence came up with prototypes that they passed around the office and suddenly everyone was using them at their computers and 3M realized that this is probably a great product. And in fact, I think it's still their top selling or close to it product. Um, we also had Patsy Sherman, the inventor of Scotchgard. Um, again, a product that we probably all used or certainly have on your couch or other furniture you've bought, uh, but you don't think about the people behind it. Um, again, with her, Fry, and most of these people, although they may be the name that we're featuring, they all talk about the teams they worked with and all the people that made it possible um, to invent and get to market um, these products. And then last not, but not least here, Wilson Great Batch um, was, is generally considered the uh, inventor of the implantable pacemaker. Um, and here on the bottom right is actually his original, um, essentially wire diagram of how he thought this would work in the heart. Um, so he has also since passed away, but we had a great opportunity to meet him. And, and like all these inventors, he's just very down to earth, curious about the world um, and loved talking about his inventive process and the playfulness of it. Um, again, I shouldn't belabor all these. Um, I'll just say that, you know, Samuel Morse is another famous inventor who you probably haven't thought of um, in this way, but we put him in the jump the track section because he represents this kind of inventor who goes from one subject area to another. So he was actually a portrait artist. Um, and we have at the museum actually his um, prototype that was based on an art easel form. Um, so, but he, he used that information with other um, interests to invent the telegraph. Similarly, Head Ski's inventor Howard Head was an engineer who wasn't a very good skier and basically uh, wanted to come up with a better lightweight ski that he could control. Um, I just wrote a blog post about him if you're interested on the Lundelson Center website. And then we have Chuck Hoberman who was a math uh, major and a scientist who invented the Hoberman sphere, which you may not know off the top of your head, but it's one of these uh, toys that was very popular um, for a while in the 2000s uh, that could expand and contract. And later he developed that idea into um, actually stadium uh, roofs that could open and close. So that's you know taking one idea and taking it to a very different level. Um, and as you can see, you know we also were trying to feature throughout this um, other historic inventors, again, who may not be as famous, um, but Gertrude Elian, who was a Nobel Prize winner in medicine, uh, Marjorie Joyner, who invented this hair perm machine, this young pair of students, uh, they were at the Hampshire College, came up with an accessible snowboard, um, and gas mask inventor Garrett Morgan, who also invented the three-way stop sign and some other important inventions. Um, these are people who, well, unfortunately, we couldn't meet Garrett Morgan, of course, uh, but uh, Matt Kaposi and Nathan Connolly, we collected some of their materials um, and we have interviews with Gertrude Elian and, and them as well. And 
I always like to bring this one up because Edison is surely the most famous inventor um, in American history. And people, when we ask them about inventors, they always bring him up. And so we actually put him in this section, many heads are better than one, because he did not do all his work alone. In fact, he invented, basically, um, the modern R&D lab. So he understood that he had a lot of great ideas, do everything. So he uh, wanted to go ahead and uh, start what he called an invention factory, where he hired people with a lot of different levels of experience um, to come help make his ideas a reality. And some of them had ideas too that were developed. Um, and so it was a nice opportunity to sort of address uh, a stereotype that exists about Thomas Edison as a sort of great or wizard of Menlo Park single genius, when in fact, part of his genius was knowing what he didn't know and knowing when to turn to other specialists. And on the modern side, um, Jerry Hirschberg, we had a chance to interview. Um, he was at Nissan Design International. And although their lab looks a little different than Edison's, there's a similar idea of having an array of specialists together with lots of materials and things to try. Um, and, um, and to show how important, you know, the, the sort of beehive of a lab like this is. So as part of this, we wanted to make sure that not only were we telling stories of inventors that we hoped would be inspirational and would exemplify this playful um, connection, but we wanted to be sure that visitors themselves had a chance to experience uh, playful inventiveness. And as I say here, to uh, you know, try some problem solving in a fun way and stimulate their imagination. Um, and so this was our uh, building, uh, playing builds creativity skills focus area. Um, and as you can see here again, uh, some of the activities that you've seen in previous images. Um, and then we have this section called Shape Your Thinking Through Play. And um, I think I mentioned before, this is an opportunity um, to really feature some of the research and interviews we had done uh, through videos, uh, but also through showing toys, both from the 19th and 20th centuries, that inventors talked about being very important in their lives, from Legos and toy trains to paper dolls to nature, um, nets to catch, you know, bugs uh, to games like the game of life. Um, that these kind of toys, you know, even the ones that seem very um, close-ended or not so much about problem solving, how they would turn around the rules or they change things or do different things. Um, inventors, you know, talked about the importance of having a wide array of playful materials. And um, we also had one of the great things here was we had a visitor feedback station and visitors would tell us about their playful um, inspirations and how it had to do with their lives. And it was really interesting because we got some, uh, I, I was reviewing most of these stories that came in and they really were um, understanding this, this play invention connection and making it applicable to their own lives and sharing some really interesting stories and some of them would talk about how, in fact, they had invented something and had never really thought about it that way. Um, but by seeing these inspirational stories, they realized that they too were invented. Um, and that, of course, is a big part of what we're trying to do, is to get people who may see themselves as inventive with a small eye, but aren't you know, comfortable saying that they're inventors. Um, and they certainly don't feel like they're um, the, the Edisons of their day. Uh, and we try to point out that there's a great continuum of inventiveness um, and that a lot of the things we do are very inventive and can in fact be inventions. Um, and it doesn't mean that we have to be an Edison to do it. So, you know, why do this? Well, as I've you know, said, and hopefully through some of these stories, you're getting the sense about how important it is to play that, that humans, um, particularly children, learn a lot of skills, um, both uh, physical, um, they learn about the properties of the world um, by playing with sand and water and uh, leaves and, and all that. Um, they learn how to build things, right? They learn something about physics as they try to put together, say, a, a bridge or a fort. Um, but they also, you know, learn to sketch and draw and, and be able to uh, express their ideas. They learn a lot of hands-on skills with tools 
Um, and in fact, today, many inventors talk about their concern that kids don't get enough time to really play with stuff, like the basics of the world, that too much time is spent in front of computers. And although computers are an excellent tool and one that we all need to learn in this day and age, um, they don't stand in for the physical world and that kind of play in nature outside. So um, a lot of inventors we talked to themselves expressed how much playing outside and with stuff and in the real world and hands-on experience really made a difference. Um, and we're trying to encourage that. And so of course, in this exhibition, we tried to focus on not computers, not technical stuff, but things of the real world, you know, fun stuff from tessellation puzzles shown on the left um, that you could make with a mirror there and you could make different designs and, and as it says, make or break a pattern, but also to take materials that were very basic um, and make them into various kinds of pinwheels, but get to test them against these fans shown in the back and really see what they could do. What, what was the, um, what are the nature of the, the materials? Um, some were harder to spin than others. Um, it gave a chance for kids to learn kind of what to look for um, and, and then think about how they wanted to solve the particular problem they saw. Um, and again, we also wanted to make sure that kids could do it alone, but also that it would encourage um, this intergenerational play. And that is also something that a lot of inventors talk about. It, it's great to play on your own. It's great to play with your friends, but it's also really wonderful to have, as I said, a mentor, a parent, a guardian, a teacher, or somebody who uh, can share those experiences with you and you can learn from them and they can learn from you. Um, ideally, the parent or the adult is not um, leading, but is following the, the younger child. Um, that helps with the child's development and confidence that they can do it. So for the people uh, you know, listening who are in, work in museums or in education, um, either informal or formal education, um, we want to encourage you to think about how you can do playful activities um, yourself that can help support and foster inventiveness. So I put together so, from uh, some past materials some of these questions about prototyping, things to think about as you're prototyping. And I mention these in part because you'll see, for those of you who are familiar with Spark Lab, that these are a big part of the development of Spark Lab activities um, as well. Um, and so, you know, one of my favorite terms here, which I included from the Museum of Science Boston, is calling it productive struggle. Uh, one of the things we've, we know from educational experience and just watching people in Spark Lab and in this exhibition um, is that people need to, to be hard enough that it makes it something that they want to sort of keep trying and that they, it's not just too easy, they can just do it and walk away. Uh, but if you make it too difficult and too frustrating, that they also will just give up. Um, so you want something where they can continue to do the steps I talked about in the beginning in Spark Lab. Uh, to think it, sketch it, try it, tweak it, and so on. Um, so, you know, this is something to test for. And um, the pictures here on the far left and far right are from our prototyping of activities. So for Invention at Play, this is what we did too. We, we took some of these activities that we were developing out on the museum floor and asked visitors to try them out and um, got their feedback. And um, things like the, the uh, sailboard simulator there on the right, uh, I remember, you know, when we first tested it out, it was just too hard. Uh, people were falling, people would get frustrated, and they'd give up. Um, and they weren't sometimes sure exactly how to judge success. So we came up with some different, uh, both mechanical um, aspects of the activity, but also signage and other things to help them feel smarter and better. Uh, but still make it hard enough that it became sort of a fun challenge. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, as I was saying, I, I think it's important that when you talk about play, it's not just about sports and games, but it is a sort of generous developmental approach of thinking about what are kids learning. It's not just messing around. It's not just pointless. Um, think about what, what are they learning about the world, about themselves as they play either alone or with friends. Um, consider a range of activities. Um, people are different, right? We all have different learning styles, different approaches, uh, different things that make us comfortable or not. 
Um, and play often actually can have a scary or, or sort of unfamiliar element. That's what makes it engaging. Um, so think about a range of activities that can fit different people's um, playful experience and, and comfort. Uh, as I said, prototyping is very important. Um, and you want to design things that are not only accessible and fun, but also sort of aesthetically pleasing. And people are drawn to things that look attractive. Um, it doesn't mean it has to be finished. I think a mistake we often make is thinking everything has to look perfect. Uh, it's not that. It's just you want it to be sort of bright and engaging and, and sort of calling your name to come play. Um, so as I say here below, you know, we're looking at when we talk about playful activities, we want them to be engaging the body and the mind, deeply satisfying, and something that both adults and children enjoy doing. <clears throat> so all of this is to say that this research that we did, um, both primary and secondary with researchers, um, with historians, psychologists, and visitors themselves, um, led us to realize that we could do more with this. We could build on some of the lessons we learned from Invention at Play. And we had the great opportunity, coincidentally, to take over a space at the American History Museum um, after the renovation that happened. As I say here, between 2006 and 2008, uh, the museum closed for renovation. Um, and when it reopened, we were given the opportunity to take over this space on the left uh, that you see there that had been previously the um, hands-on science gallery or area. And so we made it a hands-on invention area. And this was our first attempt, sort of our prototype, um, to see how this worked. And um, we learned a lot of great lessons from it. Uh, as you can see, we had on the right, you can see sort of a science lab bench. We did do more sort of science-y experiments. Um, and we found from visitor studies that because of the white lab coats that people wore, because of the, the science lab there, that people tended to walk away thinking it was a science lab, not an invention lab. And although science is part of invention, it is not the only part of invention. Uh, invention is very interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. And so um, some of the lessons we learned from this, um, we decided we would take to the next level when we were going to get our own new Spark Lab space. So here we are. Uh, in the center is the Draper Spark Lab uh, that opened in 2015. Um, you can see there's a table here, but the difference is A, it's not a, it's not a lab bench. And there's not lab materials around it. B, it's on wheels. Uh, one thing we learned is that you want to have as flexible a space as possible. Um, having a lab bench sort of took over the room and didn't allow for flexibility. And if there's anything we've learned from inventors is that flexibility is key to invention. Um, and so the space is much more flexible. We uh, typically have more um, stanchions and, and areas, uh, I should say stations, um, where there are inventive activities, but those can change in and out depending on how busy the space is. Um, but it was really helpful, like with invention in general, have a chance to do some prototyping and testing and tweaking um, to come up with what we thought was a more effective, based on visitor studies, a more effective um, learning space and invention. And we know that have providing more open-ended activities, interdisciplinary activities, um, activities that speak to different skills and interests is important. So some people like to design, some people like to build stuff, some people want to sketch like they can here at the center. Um, so I want to do all of it, uh, but it's an opportunity to provide for families a really interactive inventive experience that hopefully isn't so high tech or unusual that they can't take some of those lessons home um, and do follow up uh, explorations, hopefully at home. So um, I just want to say, you know, here on the right is a picture of myself and Nissa Buning at the opening of the Spark Lab at Holland Museum. And we were very fortunate to be able to be there for the event. And um, I know the Holland Museum is excited to be able to reopen it at some point uh, once it's safe to do so. Um, similarly, our Spark Lab is closed at the moment due to the high um, hands-on nature of it. But um, we're excited at some point to be able to reopen that too and to have uh, everyone get to experience the invention process as we have outlined it here and to see some of our wonderful volunteers and staff back like you can see there in the lower left. Um, 
we've been really fortunate to have this space um, to be able to um, try lots of different things. And in fact, uh, we look forward to using it also as a prototyping space for our next exhibition, um, which is, uh, I didn't make a slide for, but it's called Game Changers. And it's about um, sports and invention and really looking at um, how can we use sports as a sort of easy access point, much like play, um, to get visitors to see themselves as inventive and to have inventive experiences at the museum. So with that, it's a lot of talking. I hope that was interesting. I hope you learned a little something about um, the research we did on inventors and play. Um, I did write an article, if you're at all interested, um, in the International Journal of Play that goes in a little more depth into some of the things I mentioned. Um, but with that, um, I hope there's some questions from the audience. So I turn to you, Avery, to help us moderate that. All right. Well, looking at that right now, you must have done a really good job explaining everything because we don't have any questions at the moment. But if anybody has anything, feel free to put it in that chat there at the bottom of the screen. Surely someone must have a question for me. <laughs> yeah. You just did such a good job. It's a good problem to have. <laughs> Well, one thing I can say while I'm waiting, and I hope people will start coming up with some questions for me. Um, the thing I didn't mention at the beginning, but it was important to this, is that when we started this exhibit process, we really didn't know, we didn't have any guidelines about what the exhibition had to be about. So what we had was um, our initial funders had said, we'd like an exhibition on invention. That was it. And it was up to us to decide what that was. Um, and so we started out with some pretty traditional ideas about an invention exhibit. You know, we have, as I said, we have Edison and Bell stuff. So why not do something on, you know, famous inventors in American history, or you do something on like quirky inventions or, but what led us to play was um, something I kind of alluded to, but didn't say directly, which is that we did visitor studies at the beginning, which we always do with exhibitions to find out what people knew and were interested in about invention. And the thing that really came to light was how much visitors, and again, I kind of alluded to this, but how much the public, and this is probably true of people in the audience, um, how we tend to think of inventors as other. We think of inventors as like capital I, the Thomas Edison's, you know, the geniuses of the world. And unfortunately, typically they're dead white men, if I may say so, a <laughs> century figure, right? So it leaves the rest of us out. And so it was really interesting, we, we actually, being in Washington, D.C., we lucked out. We got some people on the floor that we interviewed off the museum floor at random who had invention patents themselves. Like they're actually patented inventor, right? So we thought, well, you're an inventor, you know, and they say, oh, no, 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 I'm not an inventor. I'm just a scientist. I'm just an engineer. We thought that was fascinating because if you have a patent and you don't see yourself as an inventor, then who does, right? Like, I mean, Patenting is a very narrow slice of invention, but it does tend to be equated. <laughs> so what brought us to play is realizing that we wanted to help bridge that connection uh, or bridge that disconnection between the public and their seeing themselves as not inventors or not even inventive in some cases. And these inventors that we feature that we want you to see as people you could be or are around you and maybe you don't appreciate or know about or whatever. And so because inventors talked about so much about the importance of play, we realized that that would be a good lens to use because we all play, right? Humans play, as I said, you know, from the beginning. So that's what led us to this project. Ooh. Now, maybe you have questions, I hope, maybe? Yeah, yeah, they're rolling in. <laughs> so first off, talking about Lake Spark Labs opening again, um, we have one saying, what do you think it will take to be able to open again safely, um, as well as, are any of the Spark Labs open at the moment? And I don't know if you necessarily know about all the Spark Labs, Monica. I don't, I don't know if it, Nissa, my colleague is on, maybe she can address that. Hi, do you mind answering that question? Yeah, absolutely. Can everyone hear me? Yep. All right, perfect. Um, so we do have some of the Spark Labs open in very limited ways and uh, limited in different ways. Um, one of the things that's really been interesting to see is as museums and hands-on spaces pivot, it's so dependent on geography and what's going on in local areas, what reactions are. So 
we've had some Spark Labs open who have summer camp programs coming through or pods of kids coming through to experiment in their Spark Lab and experience that. Um, we also had a Spark Lab at the Springfield Museums in Massachusetts who instead of doing their summer outreach program created kits so that even if you can't come into the museum or come into a library, you can invent at home and they really focused on the tools. So rather than, you know, cardboard and construction paper, what are the tools you need to go out and you can find cardboard, you can find milk jugs, things like that. Um, and sort of gave them those extras and those challenges to really start to think about what you could use in your daily life. And it's not just an old Amazon box, but it could be this or it could be that. Um, and so the, it's been really interesting. And I know the whole network is looking forward to, um, first of all, the day when we don't have to worry about any of this, but also sort of seeing what lessons we learn from this and what those limitations do for our personal inventiveness as well to keep everyone safe, but continue to provide that hands-on experience. Thank you, yeah. I think for history specifically, I mean, we can't say uh, the museum is, is, you know, as I said, they're opening tomorrow uh, with time tickets and limited hours. Um, it's an experiment. Smithsonian is slowly opening um, and waiting to kind of see how it goes. Um, at tomorrow it'll be nine of uh, Smithsonian museums will be open. So, um, you know, fingers crossed, but I, you know, at this point we can't, we, we have no idea, frankly, <laughs> when, when that magic moment will happen where we'll feel comfortable enough and our volunteers and staff will feel comfortable enough, you know, being in the space. Um, okay. Looking at the chat, here's one that says, um, how is the current growing trend of digital and mobile games um, kind of over face-to-face -face play? How does that fit into the space of playful invention? Yeah, that's a, that's a complicated question, more complicated than you think. Um, yeah. There's a lot of studies, you know, continuing to be done about digital play, um, the successes, the challenges, the dangers, the positives. I think like any kind of play, you know, there's one size fits all and it doesn't mean that, you know, all digital play is bad. I think, um, in fact, there's a lot of studies that show that uh, the complex games that are available now um, allow for a lot of problem solving, a lot of creativity of coming up with, you know, things that you can do or new rules or new, you know, um, that hands, hand, and hand eye coordination, of course, is a big one. Uh, for video games, there, there's, there are things that are useful. <clears throat> I think what I would say, based on my experience of talking with inventors, and I would say inventors of all ages, including young people who themselves love playing video games, is that it, it can't be the only thing. Um, that, uh, as, as one person put it, um, you know, you can build a bridge on CAD, for example, but if you have really no idea how the real world works or what physics can do, and you've never tried to build anything, it doesn't mean that that bridge on the CAD is gonna necessarily work as well as it could, or you know, that there's there are just certain things that you learn. And I think most of us can look back at our childhoods, no matter what your age is, and think about the opportunities where, you know, you built something outside or you made up a game with friends or, you know, there's a lot that you learn that's not only the social and, I mean, the physical and, and sort of mental stuff, but it's the social, right? So it's the, how do you um, negotiate, you know, certain things. Um, and yes, yeah, some of that can happen on digital games, but um, there's just this concern that, uh, you know, it's too much time in front of the computer. And I think any of us who are currently, you know, teleworking and constantly on Zoom can attest that it's tiring on the eyes and the mind and that sometimes, you know, a walk outside, a walk in nature is really restorative. So um, it's a balance, you know, it really comes down to as, as cliche as it sounds um, in this day and age, you know, you can't and you shouldn't avoid digital, right? I mean, there's a lot of life that depends on it and there are skills. And, and I would say to parents and teachers who are concerned about it that 
some games and some videos can be very educational and you can learn important skills. It's just that it shouldn't be the be all end all of their experience. And part of it is kids also need a chance to do really open-ended stuff, right? Like that doesn't have just, a, you got to do this to win that, to get to this next level. You know, there are some things that is really about this playful open-ended approach of let's try it. Let's see what happens. Let's, you know, tweak it and test it and, and, and fail and do something new and try out, you know, and, and that is inspired in part by doing actual real world things with other people outside and just in your bedroom with stuff that you have or, or the box, you know, um, or oh, James McClurkin talked about how one of the best things he got as a kid for all the Legos in the world was a big refrigerator box that his neighbors left out in the yard. And he asked his parents if he could take it. And they said, well, ask the neighbor. And they said, yeah. So he not only built a whole house, but he came up with like a air conditioning system for it and he like all these elaborate like plans. Um, and that was all, you know, from his imagination in a box, right? So there's still something about that that's important for human development. It's a long answer. I hope it's helpful. Yeah, fine. Um, we have a comment question here. It says, um, it sounds like the inventors you met are an interesting group. Was there one common denominator that you could contribute to all of them? Um, and that question also sort of ties into a previous question, previous question excuse me, um, that says, are there commonalities um, inventors talk about from their childhoods that have influenced their, their drive or inclination to event? So any, yeah. any commonalities you've seen between well, those are great questions. And, and I have had the, the real luxury, frankly, of meeting an amazing selection of inventors. As I said, diverse in age, gender, field, famous or not. Um, and, and, for, and, and I mean, in all honesty, I mean, I've met, as I said, hundreds, if not thousands of inventors, and, and I'm not just me, my colleagues at Lumble have featured all these people, you know, it's not just me running the show. Uh, but um, I can mention at most one hand's worth of people who just weren't that interesting or easy to get along with, no matter how famous. And, and part of it is, I think, common denominator, at least that I feel I have seen really across like people is their curiosity about the world like there's just literally this it's not just intellectual it's it's just a why how does that work why does that work why doesn't that work how can i do that better um yeah that's cool but is there something else i could do with it like there's they just have this way of kind of looking at the world and not just accepting it as it is but thinking what can i do better different use it for another purpose have you know and and that is, and, and they will talk about how, in part, it comes from coming, growing up in situations where, and a lot of these people do not grow up in wealthy, you know, heavily resourced households. I and mean, it's not like you have to be wealthy and highly educated, all these things, which be, you know, often become the sort of stereotype. What you need and what they talk about, you know, over and over again is having, again, a parent or a teacher or a family member or a somebody, a neighbor or something who said, yeah, sure, take that vacuum cleaner apart. Or yeah, go be messy with stuff, you know? Um, just being encouraged to explore, again, to be curious, to try to problem solve things, to ask questions. Um, you know, when kids are asking questions as an adult, it can get sometimes kind of irritating, right? It's like, okay, you know, but they're really, they are constantly absorbing information about the world, both physically, you know, kinetically, um, mentally, um, they're trying to sort out their world. And the more we can, you know, we can't always be perfect adults, right? We can't always answer every question or follow up with every you know, um, activity we'd love to do with them. But giving them the confidence to ask why, um, giving them the opportunity, as I said, to mess with stuff, um, not always saying no, or that's wrong, or that's not the way to do it, um, you know, a lot of them talk about the importance of having been said, you know, told or, or encouraged through questions like, well, what else could you do with that? Or, you know, um, well, that's really cool. You know, could you add to that somehow? Or um, why do you think that happens? Like these seem, you know, it's, it's this inquiry based learning, which we know a lot about in the educational field is really important. But for inventors, you know, they talk about 
that typically they had somebody, and it doesn't mean they're all had perfect childhood either. Don't get me wrong. I mean, some of these people come from some difficult circumstances, but they weren't just told no, or you're wrong, or that's the wrong answer, or don't do that, don't touch that, don't mess with that. Um, I think that actually is the thing that for most of the people I've interviewed um, and just talked to, you know, casually as inventors say, you know, that they were given a lot of that kind of open-ended play time, frankly. Um, okay, and then one final question here. Um, any tips for caretakers that want to encourage inventive creativity through play at home? Um, I mean, this gets, you know, it'd be like the Smithsonian says, you have to, uh, you know, there, again, there's no one size fits all answer, right? Like different people learn differently. Um, different people have different access to materials, but I think the most important point to make is that it doesn't have to be about fancy stuff. You don't have to have a highly technical things. You don't have to um, have the perfect, you know, oh, my child needs their perfect little space where they, you know, Kids, A, are very um, adaptable, but they also are sponges, as I said. So if you can, you know, say like, here's stuff, and if they get messy with it, I mean, you don't want them like, you know, painting the walls, right, necessarily, but you do want to allow them some freedom to try stuff out and to try materials out. I think this is where like uh, parents and, and, you know, people who have like, you know, the chalkboard in their kid's room or the whiteboard or something, you know, where they can sketch and play and, it's okay to draw on the wall. Uh, having, um, you know, really low tech stuff, as I said, like a box, like James McClure can use to make his, you know, house. I mean, I remember doing that as a kid and it was so fun and you're using your own imagination and you're learning about physics because when the thing falls down, because you've tried to stack, you know, 80, I don't know, stuffed animals on top and it falls over, uh, you know, <laughs> learning about physics, right? Um, it's, it's really about being given a couple options um, as, as much as possible. It can be low tech stuff. As I said, it can be stuff around your house. I mean, one activity that um, I love doing and I've done it with, uh, I did it with a group of fifth graders in Wyoming. I've done it with a group of elderly historians. I've done it with families. Um, it's called grab bag inventing. And it is uber simple, but it's a great activity. And basically all you need is a bunch of really basic stuff and it can be from around the house it can be from you know the craft store um but like for example uh when i did it in wyoming with these kids i took bags because i was teaching a class um paper lunch bags uh and in it i threw in some stuff from literally from the grocery store in casper wyoming i just went down the aisle and was like okay we got straws we've got you know paper clips we've got um uh, rubber bands, we've got some cups, we've got, you know, uh, some assorted things. I had a few uh, craft materials with me I threw in. But, you know, again, a mix of materials, as I'm saying, like providing some options is good. Um, but it's just, you know, really basic stuff. It does not have to be something fancy or expensive. And you put it in the bag and you go to the group and you put them in groups. Actually, I think having kids working together is really important because they, again, they learn how to um, like inventors do, work on teams, how you, you know, negotiate and, and different people bring different skills, right? They bring different perspectives and different talents. Um, so I often break them up into say groups of, you know, three to four and say, okay, here's your bag of stuff. Come up with a problem you want to solve and then build a prototype out of this bag of stuff. Go. Now, a lot of adults, frankly, have a hard time when they start because they want the right answer, right? Or the perfect thing. Kids get it though. They just jump right in. No, no problem, but I've done this with adults too, like just do it. So they'll come up with a problem and then they build it out of this stuff and then have each of the groups describe, you know, what the problem was and why, what they did, right? That's great alone, like just that, like just thinking, you know, literally outside the, well, in this case, outside the bag, right? And, um, but the thing I love doing then next is then saying, okay, you know, if you have people, um, I mean, you could do this in groups of two as well, but you know, obviously you need people. Um, to say, okay, now everybody pass your invention to the next table. And now the next table has to try to figure out how can I improve on this invention? Or can I make something different out of these materials that they just did, right? So, and that's when sort of the aha moment really, you can see the light bulbs like going off because 
if they've been listening, and this is also key, <laughs> um, but even if they haven't, sometimes they'll just come up with amazing stuff because even though it's the same materials that they had previously, the person the group next to them did something completely different with it. And that is where you go, oh, right. Like we can all take basic things in the world and see them differently and use them differently. And it's just a really simple way to get kind of those synapses firing about, you know, that there isn't like a set answer for everything. There's not a set end goal. Like almost anything you use, you can use in, you know, probably hundreds of ways that you didn't think of before because you didn't, you just said, well, this is a paper clip. So that's a paper clip. You didn't say, oh, well, I could use this as a hanger. I could use it as a, you know, that kind of, thing. that's just one example. Awesome. Great. Um, any other questions? I think I've gone through everything in the chat. Who has anything else? Put it in the chat now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank everybody for um, taking the time and listening in. And I hope this was interesting. It's always weird to do these on Zoom because you don't really get a sense of the, the vibe. Um, but I put my email on there because if you do have any follow up questions, comments, uh, I'm definitely more than game to get them and respond. Um, and again, there's this article I wrote. I've also written another book chapter more about the exhibition development. But anyway, if you're interested in any of that, I'm more than happy to chat. Perfect. Well, thank you, uh, Monica, for taking the time to be with us tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Avery. This was great. Um, question, will the webinar be offered via video? Um, yes, we will have this posted on the hollandmuseum.org website. So you can find it there. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so thank you, Monica. Um, we had a really good time. Um, again, if you'd like to make a donation to the Holland Museum so we can continue to offer these kind of programs, um, please go to our website, hollandmuseum.org slash support. Um, and then join us again um, for another virtual program we have coming up called A Precious Fragile Treasure, Our Vote, um, with Professor Fred Johnson from the Hope College History Department. This will be a virtual program on October 8th from 7 to 8.30, so same time. Um, and you can go to our website, hollandmuseum.org, to sign up for that, and they'll send you the link um, to that program the day before the event. Um, and then help support the Holland Museum um, by taking part in Giving Tuesday on Tuesday, October 20th from 4 to 8 p.m. Uh, you can go to the Noodles and Company on James Street here in Holland, Michigan, <laughs> for those who are not from here. Um, and they're going to offer 25% of their qualifying sales to benefit um, the museum when patrons order online. So we super appreciate that. You can see our website for more info. Um, and then the museum is open again to the public. We're super excited with new hours, Monday, Fridays, and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and be sure to join us on our free second Monday of the month um, coming up on October 12th, and that's from 4 to 7 p.m. Um, oh, sorry, I just saw one random question that popped up. Um, can you tell me more about the Holland Museum? Well, we're a small uh, museum here in Holland, Michigan. Uh, we have Dutch art, history, um, and the Smithsonian Spark Lab. Um, and you can find all sorts of uh, information on our website, hollandmuseum.org, as well as our Facebook page and our Instagram. So hopefully that answers that. Thank you again, Monica, and I hope everybody has a great night. Thank you. Just up now. Oh. Are we back?